Hello everyone. Hey guys. This is Giselle Cantu. I'm the genealogy librarian here at Pueblo City County Library District and I have with me today Mia Jensen. She is our Polynesian genealogist and she is going to present today about uh, Oceana Pacifica genealogy. And uh, so let me introduce some more. About Oceana Pacifica. Oh dear. Maya is of Kanaka Maoli, uh, which is native Hawaiian descent. She's a professional genealogist and her background is of a Pacific area content strategist and oral genealogies analyst with Family Search. And she has a podcast called uh, Tula Mole Moe. I know I'm saying that wrong. Ocean mythology and history told as bedtime stories. And you can also follow her at the Polynesian Genealogist on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok, which I will be including links to um, at the conclusion of our presentation today. So basically what I'm saying is Mia is the best of the best <laughs> and she can share uh, with uh, all of her beautiful knowledge with us, uh, genealogy and uh, how you can be an ancestor now. So I'm gonna go ahead and let Mia take over. Awesome. Thank you, Giselle, and thank you to the Pueblo City and County District Library. I'm so excited to be here and to share some of my knowledge and expertise in um, Hawaiian and Oceanian genealogy, something I'm very passionate about and just hope that this presentation can give you some answers to questions that you have or um, give you some guidance on how to get started on your family history. So with that, let's just go ahead and jump in. And again, if you have questions, you can put it in the chat. I know Giselle is a wonderful host and she's watching. So if things do come up, just shout out and let us know. So let's get right into it. So today you have um, some of the stuff that I'll be talking about. We'll be talking about perspectives of genealogy in Oceania, what that looks like and um, how that applies to us as Pacific Islanders and how we can do our research. Um, I know I have listed here Polynesian genealogy methodology, but this, I meant to change that. This methodology also applies to Oceanian genealogy methodology. And I'd also be going over some resources for us to look into. And then like Giselle said, you know, how can we be good ancestors? How can we document our lives and I'll be touching on that as well and recording our histories. So before we jump in fully, I want to clarify some things when it comes to talking about Oceania. So we have um, the Pacific Ocean. Ocean. It's the largest ocean on this planet. And it by and through colonization, it's been split up into these three regions. But traditionally, though, it wasn't this way. We were you know, you can think of the big ocean as a way that separates us as people, but um, indigenous thought has this seeing the islands of the sea as sea of islands that we're all connected through the ocean. But um, in, in modern day terms and through a lot of academia and science, a lot of ways that the Pacific Ocean has been split up is by these three regions, through Polynesia, Melanesia, and Micronesia. But the indigenous term for the entire, all three areas together through the entire Pacific Ocean is Moana, which is very fitting for the Disney movie Moana, right? So Moana means ocean, which makes sense why Disney called the main character of the movie Moana, Moana, because she's from the ocean. She is of the ocean. And yeah, so that's a little fun fact for you there. But in academia, if we're going to talk about all areas, which we're going to, you know, go into a little bit today is Oceania. So that includes everything, Polynesia, Melanesia, Micronesia. Okay. So just wanted to clarify a little bit of the vocabulary for us before we jump in. So, so what are some of the genealogical perspectives then of Polynesia, of Oceania? What does that look like? Well, for one, genealogy is everywhere. It's literally in everything that's around us from what we see here, a picture of the heavens, of the skies and the stars, to the plants on the ground, to the dirt, the soil. 
even to the currents in the ocean and the fish and the coral reef. So I know the first picture I had was of the sky and that picture shows the stars, right? Like, do you remember the movie Moana where she is using the stars to guide her? In Oceania, we name things after our ancestors. So say we name some of the stars in the skies after some of our ancestors. So when you're using the stars to guide you and they're named after your family, you're literally using your ancestors to guide you to go from one place to another. You're using the currents of the ocean to take you from one place to another. Those are also named after honored ancestors. And so genealogy exists in everything around us. And that's what makes it so powerful and all encompassing for Oceanians. Another perspective of genealogy in Oceania is the concept of time and space. Time and space is something that's been very interesting for me to look into and to learn more about. And I hope that this concept of the indigenous way of thinking of time and space can really help you to connect to your ancestors. So there's a saying in Hawaiian that I really love. It says here on the screen, ika va ma mua, ika va ma hope, which means we look to the past to guide our future. So in Western culture, we have the future in front of us, right? Imagine the space you're looking at with your eyes right now, it's in front of you, that's the future. And the things you leave behind is the past, you know, leave the past behind. So we go into the future and that's it, you know? So that's the Western way of looking at time and space. But in Oceania, it's flipped, where the past is in front of us and the future is behind us. Think about it for a second. So I don't know about you, but I cannot predict the future clearly. I struggle with that. In fact, a lot of times when I make plans, I say, I'm going to do this by this time. I have my timeline here. Does it ever really go according to plan? Not really, because I'm not a fortune teller. I cannot see the future clearly. So if you cannot see the future clearly, what does that mean in terms of our space? probably means it's behind me, right? I don't have eyes in the back of my head. That'd be cool, but I don't. So things I cannot see clearly, aka the future is behind me because I, I can't see it. But what is clear, what has happened, what is something that's observable is the past. And so the past is in front of me. With my eyes, I can see the past. I can learn the past. I can understand it. And that's how our ancestors are. We learn from them, from their past, and that guides our future. So the future, as it's hap it's, as we're getting closer to it, is coming up from behind us and coming in front of us. And our ancestors can, if they're right in front of us, they can see what's coming. They can see the future. And so listening to them, listening to their stories and learning their histories prepares us for things that we cannot see, prepares us for the future as it manifests itself in front of us. And so that's why looking to our ancestors is the key to all the things in our lives. It's learning and hearing and being in touch with them that prepares us for our future. But what does that mean for the present? That means in Oceanian time and space perspective that all of us would be the living embodiment of our ancestors in the present form. So my first full name is Miyamoto. That is my great great grandmother's last name on my Japanese side. I'm named after her. And if this statement is true about me being the living embodiment of all my ancestors, who she was, I am. And who I am, she is. We are one in the same. I'm just a different embodiment of her right now in the present form and of all my ancestors that came before me. So isn't that beautiful? That's why our ancestors are so invested in us because we are them. We're just an extension of them and living in this realm that they're not in right now, but learning from them and listening to them tells us about us in the present and prepares us for things coming in the future. So sit on that. I remember first learning it and just like my mind was blown. So that is how our ancestors read time and space. And I hope that can maybe help you a little bit in the present. 
Another perspective of Oceania genealogy is what mythology is. I know there's this idea that mythology is the concept of, you know, um, legendary heroic stories of things that have not happened <laughs> or of things that um, are just really great stories for bedtime or things like that. But mythology in Oceania actually holds a lot of truth to them. Not to say other mythologies in the world don't, because they do. They usually have beautiful lessons behind them. But the mythology in Oceania, as scientists and uh, many other culture experts have studied, they find that these are actually true accounts of what happened in the past. So, for example, um, the demigod Maui. Again, I'm referencing Moana because that's my movie and that's my girl. So Moana meets this demigod named Maui, and he's known for doing a lot of things for humankind and even for himself too. But this particular story of Maui that's known throughout um, the Pacific Islands, Maui ropes the sun because the sun was going so fast through the sky. Maui ropes it, holds on to it, and pulls it to slow it down because the sun is just whipping through the sky, preventing people from resting or taking time to recover and spend time with their families. So Maui hears the cries of the people, climbs up a big mountain, grabs his magical fish hook and makes his magical rope, lassos the sun, uses his strength and his might to fight the sun, pull it and prevent it from going too fast in the sky. And Maui wins. And that's how we have this daytime and nighttime that is separate and not one in the same. But Maui did that. That's a cool story. I love telling my son that story. But as people have actually studied it, they find that there's some truth behind this. So in Tongan culture, the sun is representative of a chief. And Maui would be designated as an honored ancestor. So the story is actually of this chief who was overworking his people, would not let them rest. He um, did all these things to get gain for himself and for selfish reasons. And so an ancestor came and up and challenged the son or the chief and fought him so that the people could have the right to rest and to not have to be uh, overworked. And that happened. And so there's truth behind these stories. There's actual accounts of this. And so we cannot dismiss mythology if we take the time to learn the indigenous languages and to recognize the symbolism behind it, um, we uncover so many treasures that maybe were lost throughout time. Another story is too, again, of Maui. He uses his magical fish hook when he's out fishing with his brothers on a canoe, and he pulls something, and he's holding on, and he tells his brothers to paddle with all their might and strength and do not look back. And Maui's just holding on, like, keep going, this thing is huge. And then... One of the brothers had a curiosity to look back and saw that Maui actually was pulling up an island, not a fish. And so the rope snapped and that's how the islands, Maui Island was formed. And so um, I've never seen somebody do that before. That'd be cool if I did one day, but right now this is a story explaining how the islands were formed in the Pacific. And so Again, there's some beautiful truths behind this, and we should take the time to really dissect and learn more about the meaningful symbols behind these incredible stories of our people. Another aspect to consider is the nature of names in the Pacific. So names mean a lot to us. Names are something that we use to show and denote ownership over either an object or an animal but in this case of uh, people of our family. And this is a picture of some of my ancestors and their names. We have so many people in our family who are named after them. And why do we do this? We do this to remember who we are, who we come from, and you know, to honor these people that are so loved and revered in our family histories. And it keeps their spirit alive, right? And so name, like learn the naming conventions, whether that be from the culture or within your own family culture, because I guarantee you there's something like that there for all of us. Next is the structure of the family. 
families come in so many different shapes and forms and through different cultures, families are structured in their own unique ways. So how does that look in Oceania? Well, I have this chart here that breaks down the family structure in Hawaii. This is a ancient Hawaiian way of looking at family or ohana. So ego, that white circle in the middle, ego represents self. So that could be me, that could be you. Let's just pretend it's me for now, okay? So ego is me. And in Western culture, all the yellow circles and green triangles that are on the same line as me um, would be either my siblings or my cousins, right? First cousins, because my parents, one generation up above me, Makuahine is my mom, Makuakane is my dad. And then they have their own siblings who have their own children. Again, that's where first cousins come in. And then two generations down where you have the pink triangles and blue circles, those are the keiki, the children, and then their cousins, first cousins or second and third cousins. And so, but in Hawaiian culture, everybody that's on the same generational line as you that comes, descends from your parents' siblings, those are actually all labeled as your brothers and your sisters, your siblings. There's no word in ancient Hawaiian for cousins because cousins didn't exist. It's like, no, you're my brother and my sister. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I grew up around a lot of my cousins and they are like siblings to me. <laughs> they, we grew up and we had such a close bond and relationship that we still have to this day. And that it wasn't just love that, you know, kept us close. It's this, we were literally practicing the indigenous way of how we view our families and their parents, my aunties and their uncles, they were all basically my mom's and my dad's too. If you look up that the next line above where it has Makuahine, mom, Makuakane, dad, my dad's dad's, my dad's brothers and sisters are my mom and my dad. My mom's brothers and sisters are also my mom and my dad. So it really creates this, I, I just see it as like this beautiful way of we are all community and we all take care of each other. And that's something we're lacking a lot today, but I would hope that as you're connecting to your ancestors that you can build up and develop more of this spirit of community within yourself, within your literal community around you, your neighborhood, your people. Um, this can be very healing because it's been very healing for me. Another perspective of um, Pacific Islander genealogy is how genealogies are shared. How are they portrayed? How do we show our genealogy? I know in, um, at least in Western culture here in the United States, we show genealogy through, you know, this is my pedigree chart, or these are my books and my ancestors, their journals. Nothing wrong with that. I think it's beautiful to understand that there's other ways of preserving and showing our genealogy, such as through traditional chants and dances. This is a depiction of ancient Hawaiians, how they would do the hula and perform and show their the way of honoring their ancestors was through the movement of their bodies. In Samoa, fire knife dancing, I know it's a big form of entertainment, but it also it also honors the family, honors the culture, honors our ancestors. I mentioned hula. I just watched Mary Monarch, which is the world's number one celebration of hula dancing and culture. If you haven't watched it before, I highly recommend you do. It happens every year in Hilo, Hawaii, on Big Island of Hawaii. And the best of the best hula dancers come and show their skills and show what they've learned over time uh, in their halau or in their groups. And they have their kumu or teachers chanting and singing for them so they can perform. And um, like I mentioned, body movement is a great way to remember something, right? So um, I love that in Oceania, people understood that paper, you know, we didn't have paper. <laughs> I don't know if you've been in a human place where um, things rot or things will disintegrate. 
because of the humidity as well as because of the rain or because of the ocean, right? The ocean is a very powerful force of nature and can wipe away islands. We've seen tsunamis and things like that. So the way that, you know, my ancestors and our Pacific Islander ancestors passed down knowledge was through the spoken word and through body movement because muscle memory remembers, right? I don't know about you, if you learned some dance moves when you were younger, or you can remember a song from when you're a little kid, if you get a little spark of that memory, if you haven't heard it or practiced it in a long time, it comes back. Like the, the soul and the fibers in your body remember. So your ancestors pass down these things within your literal DNA. And as you are, you know, embracing and experiencing more of your culture, you're not learning your culture, you're not learning these things, you're remembering. You're remembering your language, you're remembering the moves of how your ancestors honored one another and honored their culture. And so body, the body remembers. So that's why we moved our bodies to remember things. And even we also, but I know I mentioned paper stuff rotting away. Again, the body can also keep record, a little record through tatau or tattoos as depicted here in Samoa. They represent um, our family and where we come from. So again, learn, remember that you're not just learning these things about your family, you are remembering. It's coming up and being unlocked as you keep experiencing and exposing yourself to the portrayal and every other aspect of your family history. So why, why was genealogy everywhere? Why was it talked about so much? Why did people care so much about passing it down? Well, let me tell you why, through the functions of these genealogies. So there was, this is a short list here, there might be more out there that I could potentially add as I learn, keep learning about genealogies because there's still so much to learn. So why did these genealogies matter? Well, they had all these things attached to it, territorial organization, land ownership, inheritance, marriage regulation, social strata and control, political representation, feud support, ritual observance, religious beliefs and norms, intertribal relationships, trade and commerce and warfare. Whew, it's a lot, right? So um, this is a long list, but this is why genealogy was shared often. This is why they took time, they picked specific children from families who had good me memory skills and trained them from their infancy to pass, to inherit their genealogies and be able to keep it safe and pass it down generation after generation. This is why there was war because people were fighting over, no, I'm a descendant of this family, so I have the rights to this land or this means I can marry these people. It determined everything, literally everything in your life. Um, I don't know about you, that's not how I practice genealogy today. Um, I didn't marry within the culture. I, I live on land that's not um, ancestrally mine. And so it's very different today, but if you can put yourself in this mindset to understand why genealogy was so important to Pacific Islanders, it helps you to better understand why they made certain decisions, why they did certain things that they did. Um, yeah. So just try to remember this. And if you need to, you know, come back to the recording and take a look at this again, um, just to better understand and remember. Whew. So with all of that, that's a lot of context, but I'm a context girl. That's how we should learn history too, is we need to understand context of circumstances, of culture, of geography, of history, to understand why people did what they did or who, why they are the way they are. Okay. So with all that context in mind, Let's jump in into some very effective ways that you can start participating and researching your Oceanian ancestors. So the first tip I always tell people is you need to decide where you're gonna keep record of your research. Um, it's very easy to just 
research and have fun. I have fun when I research, right? That's why I'm a genealogist. And so it's easy to do that. But if you don't keep track of your work, that can be very, um, it can prevent some, it'll bring up some problems when you could have prevented it from the start. So understand that documenting your search will help you to reduce duplicative work, meaning that you won't be doing the same thing over and over again. And it can also be a source for others who can build off of your work. So I don't want someone having to repeat all that I've done when they could just pick up where I last left off. And how are they going to know that if I don't document my work, right? So one of the places I love documenting my genealogy research is through Google. And Google's free. You can pay for extra storage. I do that too because I have a lot of stuff. But um, Google is a wonderful resource. All you have to do is sign up for a free account. And then you have access to Gmail, your Google Drive, your calendar, Sheets, all these things. So take advantage of these kinds of resources to document and keep track of your work. And what are some things you can keep track of then when you do your research? So um, again, I acknowledge that this might sound really boring, but trust me, this is going to save you a lot of time. Um, here's some things to consider when you are starting to document your research and your work. So keep track of where you research. You know, did you look online at FamilySearch or Ancestry.com? Did you go to the library? Where did where did you look? Um, and then keep track too of what you looked at. What did I research? Well, I was looking for these birth records. So write down. Okay, I looked at this library, the Pueblo Library. I looked at the Pueblo Library. And I was looking through their collection. I was looking specifically for this land record there. But, uh, and this is the source that I had. So I had this um, land, these land certificates or land records from this time period. So make sure, like I said here, source your citations. Um, if you look at this image here, this is a screenshot of a record that I was keeping of my research. Um, I write down everything, the name of the source, what kind of source it was, the database, the name of it as right here, as well as when did I look at this record? I looked at it in 2016. Who was I looking for? Um, who created this source? The source, the citation ID to as much information as you can, write it out or copy and paste it. Usually there's really nice citations that are already generated for you copy and paste into your document and keep track of that. Um, the next thing too is keep track of images. Do you have pictures that you found online or in books and in journals of you know the sources you were looking for? Keep track of those. Name your images and number them. Create a nice organization file system on your desktop or on the cloud. Whatever you need to do, keep track of those things. Um, also keep track of the results that you had. So right here, um, I list, okay, this is what I found then. So I found some undocumented information about this specific family. Great. That's what I needed to find, or this is what I didn't find. And just put, if you found the positive results, yay. If you found negative results, boo. Or if you found no results, also list that too. And then put two, like, what am I going to look for next? as a result of what I found, what, what are the next steps? So again, I know this can sound very tedious, but I promise you this will help you a lot because I don't know about you. I cannot remember all the things that I look at, but writing it down will help you to be on track and keep track of your work. Number two, it's really important to create research objectives. So what are you going to look at? What is the purpose of your research and make a list of those things. Make a list of what you want to discover or learn about in your family history. And the more specific you are, the better. So here are some examples. So on the left are really good objectives. So prove the relationship between this individual, Ivan Manini Tolapapa and Falinga Tiopula 
Eva was born in German Samoa around 1914. Fa Lingo was born in American Samoa, but her birth date is unknown. Those are very, that's a very good objective because it's specific to who we are researching and it puts a little information about them. So we listed where they were born, when they were born, and um, what we don't know about falling. Uh, so those are, that's a great starting point, right? So specific is so good. It's juicy, gives you great leads. The next, find the birth records. So we listed the specific thing we want to find about Emma, Emma Makao Pio Pio and her children. Beautiful. Perfect. Next one. Better. We want to better understand what family search is and the tools available to help me in my genealogy work. So we list the repository that we're going to look at and learn from. And then we are trying to understand their tools and their resources. That's a wonderful objective. Great place to start. Whereas the bad objectives, it says we just want to do family history any research. Um, you'd be surprised how many people or clients say that to me. And I'm like, okay, well, if you do ancestral math, there's millions and billions of people who have existed before us. Where do you want to start? <laughs> you know, we can't just research everybody. Um, so we got to be specific. And that'll help us do to do the research. So be as specific as you can. And that kind of ties into the next example right there under bad objectives. Um, just find my ancestors. Again, ancestral math. You descend from so many people. Um, which person? <laughs> pick a, Just pick one person if it's too overwhelming. Um, pick one and then we can go from there. Okay. So the more specific, the better. And, you know, I say make a list of good objectives because... Um, I don't know about you. I'm very curious. I want to know everything about everybody in my ancestry. So I have a running list of, oh, yeah, I want to find out this about this specific ancestor. Write it down. And then as you are doing your research, stick to one objective that you're going to research or several. So you can say on Mondays, I'm going to research this objective. And then on Tuesdays or Saturdays, whatever day, I will research this other ancestor. You can research several at a time, but spacing it out is good too. Number three, one of the best things to do when you are doing your family history is you got to start with yourself. Take the time to sit down and identify what you already know because you'd be surprised how much you do know already um, even before you open up a web browser to look up your ancestors. Then when you sit down and, you know, have time with yourself, uh, take the, take time to write down what you know. Document. Document what you know. So we're going to use this example here of my family um, throughout the rest of the presentation here to kind of illustrate points um, that I'm making on methodology. Okay. So I have a, an objective here, a really good one um, that I gave an example of recently. So it says here to find the birth records of Emma Maka Opio Pio and her children. Great objective. And as I prepared to do research, I sat down and said, okay, well, what do I know about Grandma Emma and what do I know about her children? And this is the list here that I knew. She is my mom's mom's father's mother. So my great great grandmother. She is Hawaiian, native Hawaiian, Kanaka Mali. She was a school teacher in Kahuku on Oahu Island. She came from a prominent family down in Honolulu. She loved God, so a religious woman. And everyone looked up to her. Um, again, this is what I knew. And how did I know this? Because people told me in the family growing up. My grandma, my grandma Teresa, Grandma Emma was her hero. So Grandma Teresa knew everything about Grandma Emma. And Grandma Teresa would tell me stories about her. And so, and, you know, I heard stuff growing up from my mom talking about her or her cousins and other aunties and uncles. And so it's amazing what you think about, like, yeah, I heard stuff. I heard people gossiping or telling stories and could take that into consideration, too, when you're observing or trying to extract what you already know. 
The next step is talk to your family. This is a nice picture of our family last summer um, that we had a reunion on Molokai. So shout out to my family. But number four is talk to the family. Um, this is family history. So that means you got to talk to the family. But I list here if possible, because some of us don't have connection to the family that we're trying to learn more about, um, whether that be through estrangement or through adoption um, and other ways as well. But like I said, if possible, please consult and speak to your family um, and ask them as much as you can about the ancestors that you are researching. I have highlighted here in asterisk, remember your objective, stick to the objective because it's very easy <laughs> to go all over the place. I get it. I get excited about a lot of things. So, but when you're doing your research, you're asking the questions, remember your objective. And the next point too, if you want to and have permission to document the conversations that you have with the family, you know, uh, through writing things down through audio recording on voice memos on my phone is one way, or videos. Just, again, find your way of documenting stuff and document it and save it. So, again, with my example, I'm trying to find Grandma Emma's, uh, Gra uh, Emma Maka Pio Pio and her children's birth records. And after talking to the family, this is what they told me. Um... Grandma Emma was married to Samuel Kaumwana Kalaman II. They had six children together. Their names were Velma, Melvin, whom I descend from. He's my great-grandfather and was born in 1917. Remember that, 1917. The next child was Samuel III, then Alexander, Vernon, and Gladys. Okay. And then... The last point, no one knew where the birth certificates were for Emma and her children. This meant that I would have to look them up myself, okay? There we go. Because sometimes family members, if you ask them, hey, do you have this document about our ancestors? Some of them do, and they're willing to share. And then that ends your research. Woo, you're done. But in this case... Nobody had, <laughs> nobody in the family had them. So that means, okay, now I'm ready to go on the hunt to look up these records. Okay. But talking to the family gave me a lot more details that could have helped me in my research too. It gave me expectations of, okay, there's at least six children. And I say at least because children are the ones that get most often left behind. If you focus on your, these preconceived notions or expectations you already had, of what you'll find, you will oftentimes miss out. So be especially open when you're researching children um, because those four poor babies get left behind the most, okay? Number five, the next useful tip, number five, is to learn the history. You cannot do family history well if you don't know the history. Let me repeat, you cannot do family history well if you don't know the history, like I said, this is a family history thing. So you got to talk to the family. We focus on the family part. Now we're focusing on the history part. Okay. Because we're talking about a micro history or a small slice of history that exists within a small, small piece of that history of, of a culture of a family. Whereas macro history focuses on these big events that affected a whole bunch of people. We're focusing on the micro, but the macro impacts the micro. So knowing that history will help you to understand your family better. So again, with my example, when Grandma Emma, we're trying to find her birth records. So the starting point I have when wanting to do research or understand the historical um, context of the family I mentioned to remember that we should remember that Melvin, which is one of Emma's children, um, after talking to the family, he was born in 1917 in Hawaii. Okay. And I list here at the bottom some generation some other things to consider. There's a generational gap. Usually between 20 to 30 years is one generation to another. Okay. 
So 20, say um, a woman had a child when she was 20. So her, her and her child are 20 years apart. Okay, that's a generational gap. Normally, a lot of genealogists like to just use 20. Um, I put I like putting a range because that helps me to capture a little bit more because not every person is exactly 28, 20 years apart in a generation from one another. So a range can help. I just put 20 to 30, okay? So if Melvin was born in 1917 and Emma was most likely between 20 and 30 years old when Melvin was born, that gives us an estimated date range of when Emma could have been born. So right here, it says 1887 to 1897, okay? So that gives us a good time range. And that begs this big question down here. What was happening in Hawaii between 1887 and 1897? What was going on? And why should you care? Remember that thing, why should you care? Again, because it tells you and gives you context about what was happening to your family. So what was happening between that date range of when Emma most likely was born? The illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom, which happened on January 17th, 1893, by the United States militia in um, a military coup. So this is a picture of Iolani Palace here, which is in downtown Honolulu on King Street. If you have a chance to, I highly recommend um, visiting this palace. It's a historic place. But this is what was happening around the time Emma most likely was born. So how does that impact the family? How does that impact um, not just like their mental and emotional health or their physical health, but in terms of like genealogical sense too? Like how does this impact where we should do our research, you know? So think of those questions, keep generating questions as you are looking into the context of your family. Be curious, just bust open your brain and just let it take you to those places where you have these questions and want to know more, okay? So here's a basic timeline of the overthrow. Again, we're looking into this context to better understand my family and my people, what they were experiencing. And this will give us more clues of where to look in doing our research. So overthrow happened 1893 uh, in Hawaii, but from 1894, so a year later to 1898, Hawaii, Hawaii became a Republic of the United States. Then it became, um, it was annexed by the United States in 1898, then officially declared in 1900 as a territory of the United States. Then by 1959, Hawaii became the 50th state of the United States. So again, knowing this context helps us to break better break down what was happening to the family, but also gives us clues of where to look in trying to find, in my objective, the birth records of um, my ancestors. So I mentioned the territorial um, ownership of Hawaii because in the next part, I'll explain more. It tells us where the records are. So if Evan was born most likely in the time right before the overthrow of Hawaiian kingdom, who was in charge? Because who's in charge tells us where the records are too. Okay. Which leads us to point number six is knowing the laws of the land will determine where the records are. The law keepers make where the records go. They also determine what records should be kept, right? Um, if there wasn't a law that you um, had to have a birth certificate, what would we have instead? I don't know. But that what, that certificate was made for you and me because <laughs> there's a law. Um, social security number. Why does that matter? It's a law. It's part of the law. If you are a citizen of the United States you have to have a social security number, okay? So that is made because somebody decided to, somebody made that law. And that's why we have these documents. That's why we have these records. So you can tell I get excited knowing this stuff. 
careful law is so important. Like I said, it determines so much of our life and our lively, livelihood. And it determined a lot of what our ancestors experienced too. So with Grandma Emma's um, objective here, we're looking for her birth records. So when you look into places like Hawaii, before Hawaii was illegally overthrown, you have to understand like, okay, well, were there records, like actual document records like we have today of births? Did that matter? If not, why? If so, why? Um, you know, okay, well, where are those records kept? If we had those kinds of records, when did the records, when did they start taking those records? So again, just let your curiosity flow and ask those kinds of questions. I know it feels nitty gritty sometimes, but when you're a genealogist, that doesn't matter. <laughs> the more, um, more curious and the more willing you are to find the details, the better of a researcher you are too, okay? So keep asking those questions. So what we know from looking at the historical context, we understand that the jurisdiction around the time that Emma was probably born is either she was um, born at the time when Hawaii was taken over by the United States. So most likely we have records of her created by the United States. If not, it was by the kingdom of Hawaii. But what, or, yeah, so that, again, that gives us areas of where to look. So when we're looking at United States records, though, what kind of records existed um, at around that time, around 1900s, when Emma most likely was born? Um, there are census records. So those are records taken every 10 years. And why they're taken, it's for tax purposes. But they contain so much information about the family, names, birth dates, birthplaces, um, addresses. And, you know, the censuses have evolved over time. So... There's some that have more information than others, genealogically speaking, but that's a record type to consider. Um, court records as well, they are used to document cases that happen within the court, kind of obvious, right? But we need to keep record of what um, cases are happening there or what petitions are going on. So those are court records. Probate records are a type of court record. They prove the authenticity of a last will and testament of someone who's died. So when someone makes a will, they pass away, um, that will goes into probate. And so the court then helps to determine the real and personal property of what is listed in the last will and testament and how that be divided up to the heirs and listed within that probate record. So probate records are also a great genealogical source. And then there's vital records, which we are looking for for Emma. We're looking for her birth record. Vital records document the vital events of an individual's life, their birth, their death, and their marriages, if there's multiple marriages that they had. So again, who decided who who decided this was important to document? Well, somebody in the United States long time ago decided this. And that's why we have records. But this is where we can look. Again, knowing the law, knowing the history makes it a lot better for you. Well, you make yourself a better researcher when you know this stuff. And I also also have to put a plug in for cultural laws because cultural laws are very, very important to know, um, especially when we're talking about the Pacific. We know a lot about colonization because it's well documented. We know a lot about um, the legal overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom and all these other um, places all these other things about places that were colonized. We're learning again and remembering again the cultural laws if they have been erased. So take time to understand, okay, well, if we have literal laws here in the United States that tell us what kind of records to be made, who, what kind of cultural laws did we have and what kind of records were made from those? Um, the records that we can consider in, in the Pacific is like oral genealogies. That's a literal record too. Um, who who determined who could be an oral genealogy keeper? Who It was the village leaders usually, the chiefs and chiefesses who determined those things. Why did they do that? Because it's important to our people and why we need to understand this. And so taking the time to really 
Dig into these things can help you to know where to look when you're doing your genealogy research. Number seven, here we go. We're now, now we can really dig in to the records of our ancestors. Okay. This is an, ex I love this part. Very exciting. So you can take a screenshot of this if you want or make notes, but remember this is being recorded. So don't worry if you don't remember it all. But here are a few places that I highly recommend people look when they are doing their Pacific Islander genealogy research. So family search being at the top because it's a free resource. Shout out to family search. Um, I know just at the beginning said I work for them. I don't work for them anymore, but I still point people to go there and sign it for a free account. Um, this account or this database and resource is run by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, and it's made free through the tithing money of their members. And so anybody can sign up for an account, whether you are a member of that church or not, and still have access to all the records, all these resources that they have, highly recommend. Ancestry is next. They are a paid subscription. Again, another great resource. They have a lot of similar records that FamilySearch has. Um, they have some different features like DNA and... Um, public or private family trees that are a little different from what family search does. Um, but what's really cool is if you cannot afford or do not want to pay for ancestry subscri subscription, because it can be really expensive, you can go to your local library. So I know I have that at the bottom. I need to bump it up to the top because local libraries oftentimes have subscriptions that you can access for free. All you got to do is go to the website um, or to the library in person and ask if they have a library account, and then you can do your genealogy work through them. So shout out to the libraries. Go to the Pueblo Library and access this resource. And next, National Archives. So these National Archives are archives that capture records of the people from the entire country, okay? Whereas there's some other archives that are for smaller jurisdictions like a county or even a city, or a family or a company. Um, Disney has their own archives, you know, so shout out to them. But looking into the National Archives can also help you have a broader perspective of what um, was happening to the nation and to some of your ancestors that are may, may be in those records. University of Hawaii is also a great place. Um, they have a wonderful library there, wonderful archives too. They have plantation records there at their um, library um, that you'd have to see in person and some other great resources too. But I have listed here Hawaii Nui Akea because they are the Hawaiian Studies Center. And during the pandemic, they had weekly um, Zoom meetings and webinars where you can come in and learn from ex experts throughout the entire Pacific. And I learned so much from them. So I highly recommend looking up this center, Hawaii Nui Akea, and looking through their website to find those and learn as much as you can. Pacific Manuscripts Bureau is also a great place. They collect manuscripts, which are just, um, which are sheets of paper or other kinds of forms of documentation throughout all the Pacific, digitize them and preserve them and make it public for everybody to look at. Archives New Zealand, um, a big shout out to them. They are the National Archives of New Zealand, but they're just called Archives New Zealand. They also um, are a phenomenal resource and have great records there of the Maori people, the indigenous people of Aotearoa or New Zealand. And so um, they have a whole section there dedicated to genealogy as well. So take a look at these resources. Again, great places to look at. So when you are researching records, these are some steps to consider. Um, so when you open up a search, whether that be a website or talking to an archivist or a librarian, you need to have in mind what records you're going to look at. Right now with my objective, I'm looking for birth records, okay, or records that point me to find the specific birth record that I'm looking for. Then know what you're looking for, okay? So know the record, then know what you are trying to find in the record. But if you're unsure, you can do some searches 
through lookups and research guides in repositories, archives, and libraries. There's a lot of people who take the time to create these beautiful guides that are so thorough and thought out that make it easy for you to do research and have it all in one place for you. Okay, and I'm gonna show you one. And when you're looking through records too, make sure to consider not just doing big general searches, which there's times and places for that, but looking at the locality records, so the location or the place, looking up specific names, whether that be the name location, names of the village, names of the family members, and the names of dates. I'm sorry, and then dates, not names of dates. One research guide that I always recommend to people is looking at the Family Search Wiki, which again is for free. Um, all you do, I took a screenshot here. When you log into your account, you click on search, and then this drop down menu will pop up. Click on Research Wiki, and it'll take you to this next landing page and type in the locality here. So, in this video, I typed in Hawaii, and this is the research guide that popped up. It has all these record types right here on the side, has maps right here, it has guides on how to look into these records, breaks down the counties that I have here in Hawaii, other genealogical resources like Facebook communities, some historical records and databases. Um, it, it's just phenomenal, right? So look into these research guides because somebody did all the work for you you don't have to start from scratch. Look into these research guides. But if you're like, okay, if you forget research guides, Google is at your dispense, right? You can use it anytime. So I did this quick Google search. Here's an example for Hawaii censuses. I was curious, hmm, what, what kind of censuses existed in Hawaii? What did they look like? After Googling, I found this research guide from UH, University of Hawaii, Manoa Library, and took the screenshot here of what the census records um, were in Hawaii. And I mean, they got some great detail here. Look at this. They break down the censuses from 1840. Wow. Long time ago, right? And then when this was from Hawaii Kingdom, okay, so before the overthrow, but then after the overthrow, starting from 1900 is when we had census records in from the United States. So, and they point to where you can look at them. There's microfilms at the University of Hawaii Library, or you can look online. It says here, Family Search, Ancestry, Heritage Quest. There's so many places to look at these records. So check out the research guides. They're your best friends, okay? Now I'm going to show you real quick how to do a search on family search of records, okay? So I have my family search account. I'm going to sign in real quick. Again, it's for free, so I highly recommend you sign up if you haven't yet. And I'm going to go to search. And I'm going to do a record search, okay? So like I told you, some tips. We can look at, we can type in names here. We can type in place or year. I'm going to type in a place first. I always, I usually recommend people type in or look by locality. This really, they bring you to this new page that specifically has Hawaii records just for you. So now it'll search for records of your ancestors within these Hawaii records, okay? Isn't that cool? So let's, let's just type in Grandma Emma's name, her married last name, now Kalama, and let's see what pops up. There's a lot of results here, 503. You could look through all of them if you wanted to. Um, I recommend you don't. <laughs> that would be a lot of time. So we can be a little bit more specific then to kind of narrow down our search results. So, I mean, these are cool. Like there's some great records here. You can click into it and look. Let's just take a look real quick. And another tip to consider in mind, when you open up a search result, you can just look at this right here, which is considered an index. An index is um, when people come in 
and or the computer, they type out what they see information from an image or from an actual record. And they put it on here and we have these indexes because these are searchable. Images are not as easily searchable yet. Um, technology is coming out every day though to make it better. So I always recommend if there's an image, yes, take a look at the index, but open the image. I cannot emphasize that enough. Always open the image because sometimes the index can be wrong. No one's intentionally trying to come in here and like skew your research and make it difficult for you to find family members. But sometimes people make mistakes because we're human. So take a look at the image, okay? Um, and you can compare what's on the image to the index that's on the right-hand side here and observe, okay, this is what the, rec or the index is saying, who the father is of Emma, and where does it say that on the record? You know, it says that right here. That looks like a Joseph K. Kalama. So verify, audit what the index is saying, compare it to the image, okay? And what's cool too is you can also download the image for free and then change the naming convention on it in your drive. So, and you can also attach this in, these records to your ancestor in your family tree. So I can compare the record here to who is in my family tree. So I can type in, oh, I'm looking for Grandma Emma or whoever and attach it to my tree. So that is a really great way to also keep track of your records is attaching it to the tree. But real quick, going back here, after looking at the image, cool. There's 503, if I'm remembering correctly, 503, why is this taking me so long? Search results, there we go. There's a lot of search results. You can narrow it down a little bit more now by putting um, year range. So what did we put? I think we put 1887, 1897 as potential birthplaces. And it narrows down the search a little bit better. So starting out broad is good and coming down a little bit more can help you narrow down your search. So consider that and keep that in mind as you're doing your record research, okay? Sorry, I'm still rolling because we're getting close on time here. Let's just keep going. So I cannot talk about Pacific Islanders in our genealogy without acknowledging Pacific Island oral genealogies. I actually took this picture um, when I was in Samoa about a year and a half ago, recording oral genealogies of chiefs in Samoa. One of the best experiences of my, of my entire life. One of the best places to look for oral genealogies is through Family Search. They have one of the largest collections of Pacific Islander genealogy records. Sorry, I forgot to put that there specifically oral genealogies and you can look at them on family search for free and i'm going to do another demonstration of how to find those so let's go back to the home page we're going to click on search go down to genealogies okay search the genealogies open it up brings you to this nice landing page scroll down don't type up top, scroll down and click on this section here, oral genealogies, search for a person. I'm sorry, go back. Look at view all trees. That's what I meant to click on. Okay, there's 1.3 million people um, in these oral genealogies. That's a lot of people. What did I say? We narrowed down first, go by locality. Okay, so... I'm going to type in Samoa in here just because I'm Samoan and I want to put Samoa first. And it has all these oral genealogies that are tagged being in Samoa, which also includes, if I'm not mistaken, American Samoa too. So those search results will tell you the tree name, the oral genealogy, or the collection is an oral genealogy, how many people are listed in these genealogies, and when this tree was last updated. So I'm gonna click on this one right here. 
just because 76 is a pretty big number. It'll bring you to this landing page. If for some reason you're like, oh my gosh, this is my ancestor. I know these people. That's great. You can type in um, some people you would like to search in their genealogy. I always tell people just click on search because it'll pull up this whole page of every single person that's listed in the oral genealogy. And when you click on one of the names, it all takes you to the same place, okay? You can click 76 times on all these names. It'll take you to the same place. It'll take you to this view right here. This is a pedigree or a family tree of the oral genealogy, okay? Because the person that was being interviewed, this individual right here, Vaunga Saena, they were being, oh, I'm sorry. This is the genealogy of this person here, but given by Fafai Tuivale, okay? This is the genealogy given, and you can, you know, zoom in and take a look at the genealogy and observe how many children are listed within the genealogy. You can scroll down. Oh, look, your citation. Copy this and put it in your research log, okay? You can also attach this to the tree if you want, but here's where the juicy stuff is, the good stuff. Click on show more detail, and it'll pull up all these files right here. What? So you can actually listen to the MP3 file of the oral genealogy. Let's play. So these are actual oral genealogies from what? When was this taken? 1984? Yeah, a while ago. So I don't know if this person, the interviewee, is still around, but, oh, whoops. You can click and listen to the two MP3s that are here. You can also open up the Samoan PDF. So this is a transcription of the oral genealogies from Samoan in here, and you can read along as the person is reciting their genealogy. It shows here that the genealogy that we're specifically looking at is found in section one. So this right here, where it's blue, this is the genealogy that's given in Psalm 1. There's also the English translation. For us who are still learning their indigenous languages, this is very helpful, right? <laughs> so take a look at the English translation. Boom. What's so nice, too, is they um, put in bold the names. So it makes it a lot easier to scan through and look. Um, you can also do a command F and do a search, right, of a name in here. Oh, whoops. So that also makes it easy to look. Oh, look, Malala is right there and also right here, or similar name. And again, you can download the PDFs, you can print them off, you can tag ancestors that are listed in the genealogy into your family tree so it's attached to them as a record. Um, this is so cool, right? So take a take some time to look through these oral genealogies. You might find your family, or if you just want to listen to the oral genealogies of others, you can do that too. It's pretty, pretty special. I get chills every time I listen to them. Okay, we're, we're getting to the end here, y'all. Thanks for holding strong, okay? We're almost there. Some other notable uh, genealogical resources for Polynesian and Oceanian genealogy work. So I love maps. I don't know about you. I love maps. And one great place to look, I always tell people to look um, for maps, is native land, native land um, native-land.ca. They are a digital uh, map resource documenting indigenous lands and territories. So I took a quick screenshot here of New Zealand and Australia. Australia is considered part of Melanesia in the Pacific, but you know, we family. So Australia and New Zealand, but some people come in. So volunteers, that can be you and me or people who work for the site, come in and document the territories and the names of the territories with their indigenous names. And you can click on it and it'll open up another page showing you some history 
uh, links to either the tribal or village websites that they have associated with that territory, um, some language guides to it helps. I mean, there's so many cool things. So I highly recommend looking at this resource if you're curious to see kind of like a visual of the maps. Um, if, and if you know information about land in the Pacific and you want to contribute, please contribute. You would be a great help for all of us. So consider that. And the next resource here, um, Polynesian DNA. I have a lot of people who are very curious about DNA um, and curious to know more about how DNA can support our genealogical work and research. I will be the first to admit I'm not as confident yet in understanding and teaching about Polynesian DNA, but my friend Kalani Mondoy is a phenomenal genetic genealogist who is Polynesian and who can help us break down how to do Polynesian research with Polynesian DNA and the methodology behind that because traditional DNA research or DNA um, genetic genealogy work is, you know, uh, centered on Eurocentric practices and methodology. For Pacific Islanders, we have a very different way of how, again, we structure the family and um, practice endogamy. Endogamy is incest, is another way of saying that, where we have a lot of interweaving between um, family members and descending from them and what that looks like in our DNA. So I recommend looking at Kalani's blog, hawaiandna.wordpress.com, and learning and researching his work because he breaks down things for you and he's just phenomenal. And if you're also curious, he has a Facebook group, um, Polynesian DNA, that you can join and be part of and get updates and ask questions and support from and gain support from the community. Last thing I want to really highlight is there's no point in doing, in my opinion, just doing one side of genealogy work if you cannot do the other side. You can look at your ancestors and learn about them but you're gonna be an ancestor one day, right? We're all gonna be ancestors one day. So it's really important to take time to document your life and your history. Um, this, is a, this is a way to document your history through photographs. Um, this is a picture of me, my son, and my grandma. Um, I'm so glad we have this picture because she passed away a few years ago. And um, this is a way of keeping her visually alive for me and my family. And she was, to me, the epitome of a good ancestor, just always doing good things, documenting her life, journaling. And we have record of that and we can turn to that as a source of help and strength um, in our lives. So one way you can document your history is through this app called StoryCorps. They are a phenomenal website that's dedicated I'm sorry, not just website, but company that's dedicated to capturing the oral histories of our communities and of our families. And they created an app, a free app that any of us can use and download on our phones. I believe both on iOS and Android. And you can use that to record oral histories of your family. So when you open up the app, they also have prompts, like prompt questions you can ask specifically about maybe the person, the interviewee's military experience or education experience, upbringing, and all that you can document through this app for free, save it, and you can also upload it onto their website to share the oral history with others, but also you can save the oral history and have it be preserved through the Con Library of Congress, which will preserve it for all time for you and for free. So. Um, I would highly recommend taking a look into this if you're trying to figure out where I should, you know, document my research or document oral histories. This is one great place to look. Another, other great ways of documenting your life and of being a good ancestor now, journaling. I have picture a camera here. You can take pictures. I have friends who write stories or short poetry and short stories. Sorry. Some people film. You know, I TikToks are fun, little reels are fun. Um, filming your family 
we're making music and passing along songs of our family is a big deal in my family too. We are a musical family and we pass down songs from generation to generation. And below, I just have, you know, spending time with your family, gathering together, having movement, whether that be through dancing together or singing or um, just being with each other. Preserve those memories. Preserve them in your own unique way. And to close, again, I just want to emphasize how important it is to choose to be a good ancestor now. Like I said, we're all going to be ancestors one day. How are you living now so that you are a good ancestor for those who are coming in the future, who will be descendants of you, whether they literally be descendants of you or they be other nieces and nephews? Because guess what? People are going to look at you. (laughs) If people didn't look at my ancestors that much back then, there's a lot more of us looking at them now, right? And so... There's going to be a lot of people looking at you too and looking to you. I am being a lot more conscious in how I live my life because I understand not just that people are going to look at me, but I'm passing down things to them too. And I want to pass down goodness. I want to practice some practices of healing, of being a good citizen, a responsible citizen, of being a loving and kind person to Um, my family into the community. And so I would highly recommend you take the time to observe how you are going to be a good ancestor and let that guide you throughout your life. And I promise you, this will bless generations to come because you are making those conscious decisions now. So mahalo, everybody. Thank you for coming to my presentation. I really appreciate you all. And I hope you learned something. And if you have any questions or any thoughts, please put them in the chat here. Um, Also, here are some ways you can stay in touch with me, too. Hit me up on all my socials here. Or if you want to message me, you can. So thank you again. And with that, um, I'll pass this back over to you, Giselle. Hello. Okay. Wow. There was so much that I did not know. I did not know about the oral genealogies with Family Surge. I did not know all of those uh, resources that you listed and that StoryCorps had an app um, and also Google for documentation. I did not know. I had not explored that as a, as a possibility either. Uh, it just goes to show you think you know a lot and you turns out you don't really know as much as you thought you did this is all great advice uh, i loved every minute of this uh, it does not matter uh, whether your genealogy can be traced to oceana or not this is all great relevant advice for anyone as trying to research their genealogy and i just loved how you talked about uh trying to get more uh in touch with uh your ancestry uh at the beginning i wrote that uh, the past is in front and the future is behind us i felt that i was like oh my gosh you know when you do genealogy you want to be more in touch with your ancestors and that is a great mindset to have when it comes to your ancestors um i'm gonna go ahead and put this up um yeah so your no no problem. Uh, your the Instagram wasn't loading properly, so I don't have it listed. Okay. But I do highly recommend to everyone watching, uh, listen to her podcast. Try uh, looking at her information on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. The information that you saw here is the same information, and she does regular updates. So. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom and insight. That was a lot of information, but it did not feel overwhelming. And uh, I do thank you for that. Uh, it was it was not an info dump. It was definitely this is this was so good, and I'm so glad that we are going to have this on our website. So, uh, if you're watching, we are going to have this on our website and on our YouTube channel from now to 
forever, I do recommend you go back and you take some notes and you reference and also um, check out her websites and her podcast and you know uh, shoot me a, a, a question if you if you have some questions on some of this the, that was just so great thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us greatly appreciate it thank you mm-hmm. uh, really thank you so so much yeah that was just so beautiful so um if anyone has any uh questions you can go ahead and put them in the chat on Facebook or, or YouTube in the comment section right now, and we can go ahead and address that right now. Any questions at all? Okay, I am seeing none okay. listed. Okay. Okay. No, yeah, I know you shared a lot, but is there any any other final thoughts you want to share with us before we before we leave? Um. Just that, yeah, you can do this. Anybody, I really believe that family history should be accessible and it is becoming more accessible for all of us. And if you just embrace some of these ideas and tips on how to do it, you can be your best researcher for your family and for yourself. It's totally possible. But if you ever need extra guidance or help, I'm also looking for clients. If you need extra support, you can reach out to me. I'd be so happy to talk and help you along. So I just wish you all the best of luck and know that your ancestors, they want to be found by you. So they're going to help. Okay, I promise they're going to (laughs) help. So just get started on it and you'll be surprised what comes up. Excellent. Excellent. And that is so true. So just think about it. your ancestors want to be found and then in the future, someone is going to find you. So also be a good ancestor now. So uh, with all that, thank you so much, Mia. We appreciate you. you. Thank you for spending your time with us uh, virtually in Pueblo, Colorado. And we will remain in touch. And everyone, if you want to keep staying in touch with Mia, you can uh, via these websites and Instagram. And, uh, you know, it's just all be in touch and don't let uh, an area of genealogy uh, be a deterrent to you. Some people may think uh, ocean genealogy, oh, that doesn't affect me. My family crossed the Atlantic, not the Pacific, you know, as we saw today, that is totally not true. Mm -hmm. This is really great information. And, you know, hey, for all you know, we might have had an ancestor across the Pacific Ocean and just don't know about that yet. Yeah. You just never know. You never know. You never know. Mm-hmm. So once again, me, I cannot thank you enough. Enjoyed you. every moment of this. And we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. And thank you, everybody, for watching and those in the future, too. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.